In his classic essay, The Fine Art of Baloney Detection, the science popularizer and astronomer Carl Sagan explained why he was so worried about bad reasoning. Rather than just voicing his irritation, however, Dr. Sagan included a kit for detecting such bad reasoning. This was his famed baloney detection kit. In it, he included nine simple tools for detecting if something is nonsense or not. In addition to listing these nine tools, I'm also going to give a couple explanatory sentences to help us understand them better. If you enjoy this and want me to do similar videos in the future, please like and subscribe below. And with that said, we're going on to the show now. Rule number one, whenever possible, there must be independent confirmation of the facts. Centuries ago, before the advent of the social sciences, philosophers John Locke and David Hume were already speculating about the follies of human reasoning and the limits of eyewitness testimony. Both men were very concerned that innate flaws in human reasoning would taint such testimony and make it unreliable evidence. While they lacked empirical evidence backing their ideas at the time, the idea that human reasoning is tainted with cognitive bias has been vindicated by over a century of research in psychology and behavioral economics. Given this folly, it's of tantamount importance that we have independent lines of evidence which back our conclusions. While this certainly can't eliminate our cognitive biases, we're after all stuck with them, it can minimize them. This safe check, however, should extend far beyond mere eyewitness testimony to all types of evidence. If, for example, we're reading a newspaper article and it only has one supporting source, while a story which contradicts it in another newspaper has multiple sources, all things else equal, we're better off trusting the newspaper with multiple sources. While this does not guarantee that we'll never be wrong, after all, everyone's wrong on occasion, it certainly minimizes the likelihood. Tool number two, encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. Since the scientific revolution, one of the key strengths in science is that it encourages critical examination and spirited debate. When we are making major decisions, such as who to vote for or what political party to support, it is very important that we encourage debate and free-spirited discussions. Dr. Sagan, however, is not encouraging a wild west of everything goes. He means experts and people who are very informed. If we want to learn how government funding impacts science, for example, we're far better off listening to economists who are experts on this issue than talk show hosts who have no idea what they're talking about. As we can learn from reading Plato's classic dialogues, listening to sophists and charlatans discuss issues and debate them who have no idea what they're talking about can actually leave us in a worse spot than where we started off at. This is not what Dr. Sagan had in mind. Tool number three. Arguments from authority carry little weight. Authorities have made mistakes in the past. They will do so again in the future. Perhaps a better way to say it is that in science, there are no authorities. At most, there are experts. No scientist has their ideas accepted merely because they have the word sir next to their name or because they're part of some academy. Science, by its very nature, is rather conservative. It does not easily adopt new theories. And scientists themselves are very skeptical. To convince them of a radical new theory, you need to present extraordinary evidence. This is sometimes doable, like when a Charles Darwin or an Albert Einstein comes around. Both these men, however, presented overwhelming evidence and very strong arguments. Neither one of them said, you should accept me because I'm famous or because I said so. They let the mountains of evidence which supported them do the talking. Just as in the case of these examples from the history of science, we should never accept anything in our day-to-day -day lives simply because, quote, I said so. Tool number four, spin more than one hypothesis. If there's something to be explained, think of all different ways in which it could be explained. Then think of tests by which you might systematically disprove each of the alternatives. Whatever survives, the hypothesis that resists disproof in this Darwinian selection among multiple working hypotheses has a much better chance of being the right answer than if you had simply run with the first idea that caught your fancy. One of the key figures in the scientific revolution, Sir Francis Bacon, wrote extensively about scientific methodology. To Bacon, it was already apparent that the human mind had many follies built into it. Thus he thought, 
scientists needed a list of methods that they could employ to eliminate false hypotheses. This is important to do because, after all, scientists are people. This, however, is also very true of opinions in which we reach in our daily lives. To get to Dr. Sagan's point about how to apply this in our daily lives, you, I, and everyone else we know assuredly hold some of our positions merely on aesthetic grounds. By this I mean we simply like the way they sound or look. That's okay, that's part of being human. Everyone does that. But we should, however, go out of our way with important ideas to consider alternative hypotheses and try our hardest to eliminate those which are false. If a hypothesis survives this rigorous testing, as Dr. Sagan points out, then we have reason to put greater stock in it. Tool number five, try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. It's only a way station in the pursuit of knowledge. Ask yourself why you like the idea. Compare it fairly with the alternatives. See if you can find reasons for rejecting it. If you don't, others will. As we have already talked about, human beings have cognitive biases built into their thinking patterns. This is okay, that's just what it means to be human. We, however, need to apply extra scrutiny to ideas we think of ourselves. That's because human beings tend to like their own ideas and fall in love with them. This is true in science as it is in daily life. A big difference, however, is that science has built-in mechanisms to detect this type of thing. This is most certainly true of peer review. In science, peer review is applied when one scientist is trying to get their work published. When they submit it for publication, their peers critically examine it to see if it stands up to muster. So that they are not publicly outed as a sloppy thinker, many scientists take into account potential objections that their peers could have before they publish. They also try their hardest to be very clear and explicit about their methodology. This way, their peers can see how they got to their conclusions. While we do not have the benefit of peer review in our daily lives, when it comes to important decisions that we make, such as should we vaccinate our kids, we can ask ourselves, am I wrong about this? Am I taking into account what the evidence says? Am I listening to the experts? What do they say about this? While it may not be as formal as peer review, this type of thinking certainly points us in the right direction and helps us see the folly of our own reasoning. Tool number six, quantify. If whatever it is you're explaining has some measure, some numerical quantity attached to it, you'll be much better able to discriminate among competing hypotheses. What is vague and qualitative is open to many explanations. Of course there are truths to be sought in many qualitative issues we are obliged to confront, but finding them is more challenging. When science first started, there is no unified measurement system. Despite what we think now, the metric system was not handed down from the clouds, but a work of many scientists over centuries. While they lacked the metric system, the early modern scientists, such as Galileo, tried their hardest to attach numerical value to everything. This made their explanations distinct from philosophers such as Aristotle. Unlike Aristotle, Galileo's explanations were quantitative, not qualitative. This means that he thought that properties such as momentum, mass, and velocity were the most fundamental. Other attributes, which Aristotle would have put high stock in, such as smell and color, were in some sense to Galileo illusory. While this sounds very speculative and metaphysical, stamping numerical quantities on everything that's possible, like Galileo did, is one of the main reasons science has progressed so rapidly in such a little time. When values are quantified, it's much easier to see if they are right or wrong through testing. In our daily lives, we can apply this when examining random things in the store. For example, if there's a set of vitamins that say vague things like boosts the immunity or raises the spirit, think to yourself, what does that mean? How could you quantify that? If, after some research, you can't think of an answer that makes any sense, then that might be baloney. Tool number seven. If there's a chain of argument, every link in the chain must work, including the premise not just most of them. As philosophers who study logic have shown over the last 2300 years, an argument is only as good as its premises. To see what I mean by this, let's examine a classic logical argument. Premise one, all men are mortal. Premise two, Socrates is mortal. Conclusion, therefore Socrates is a man. Notice how this argument could possibly fail. If all men were not mortal, or Socrates was not a man, 
then the conclusion would not logically follow. For the last 2,000 years, philosophers have been examining arguments based on certainty like the one we just said, and those based on probability, such as X will probably happen given the evidence I have for it. Both of these types of arguments are substantially weakened if the reasons we have for supporting them are false. Deductive arguments, like the one we just went over involving Socrates, are outright disproved if their premises are false. While arguments based on probability become substantially weaker if we have less grounds for supporting them. Tool number eight, Occam's Razor. This convenient rule of thumb urges us, when faced with two hypotheses that explain the data equally well, to choose the simpler. If you have a pulse, you've almost certainly heard a version of Occam's Razor. Usually most people say it's that the simplest explanation is the best explanation. This is not exactly right. A far better way of putting it is that we should not, as the classic philosophers urged us, multiply entities beyond necessity. While this may sound confusing, if we consider an example, it will make perfect sense. Say I walk into a room and I have a briefcase with me. I have two friends in the room and one says to the other, I wonder why he's holding that briefcase. The first friend says, I bet it's because he's a banker. The second friend then says, I bet it's because he's a banker and he likes the smell of leather. While we may be inclined to think that the second explanation is better because it has more details, it in fact is less likely because of Occam's razor. If you don't believe me, then apply one of our other tools and assign numerical values to these claims. For example, get the odds of me being a banker 95%, and the odds of me liking the smell of leather 98%. Then do the multiplication for yourself and see how it turns out. Tool number nine. Always ask whether the hypothesis can be, at least in principle, falsified. Prepositions that are untestable, unfalsifiable, are not worth much. Consider the grand idea that our universe and everything in it is just an elementary particle, an electron, say, in a much bigger cosmos. But if we can never acquire information from outside the universe, is not the idea incapable of disproof? You must be able to check assertions out. And Everett's skeptics must be given the chance to follow your reasoning, to duplicate your experiments, and to see if they get the same result. What Dr. Sagan is hinting at here is what philosopher Lee McIntyre has called the scientific attitude. This attitude is a sensitivity towards empirical testing. When someone making a claim lacks this attitude, i.e. they aren't sensitive towards the evidence, then we should approach what they're saying with a great deal of skepticism. While it may seem like common sense, this point is both profound and very important. In fact, it's hard for me to do it justice here. If you want to know more about it, then I've included a link to an interview with Dr. Lee McIntyre in the description below, along with other links on these other topics. This includes a link to Dr. Sagan's article itself. And with that said, that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe below and send this link to a friend. And until next time, stay skeptical.